everyone, I'm Kendra Cook. And I'm Autumn Shaner. And this is Bumper to Bumper. Bumper. As usual, first of all, first of all, I want to thank everybody for tuning in and watching. And thank you for the nice comments and all the encouragement. And it really means a lot to us. And thank you. And uh, we have fun here doing this. And we're hoping that you have fun watching and learning with us. Yeah, this has been a good experience. We're really enjoying it. Yeah. So, yes. So at the end of uh, last month, we said that this month we were going to talk about uh, a certain kind of truck that was built uh, here at the Boyertown Auto Body Works. Um, so of course the museum is in the, Boy the old Boyertown Auto Body Works factory. We did all sorts of different ty types of trucks here. Um, started out as delivery, but then they started to branch out and do some more customized things. And uh, one of those types would be uh, the bookmobiles. Yes. So they did build bookmobiles here. And we're going to throw up a few images there on the screen. You can see some of the things that were built here on site. Um, back from the 1940s to the 70s uh, is when they were building these here. And we like these trucks. I mean, first of all, it's just cool. The wood inside of them is really neat, all the shelving and everything. But also, um, those bookmobiles were used all over the United States. Yeah. And they even had a global reach. You'll see the one photo up there um, for uh, the United States Information Service. That one went to Indonesia. So uh, that's a distance. Yeah. <laughs> that's not our backyard. So uh, that's really neat that, that in that way the Body Works had a reach beyond Pennsylvania, which is always what we focus on usually. Um, but there is a history to bookmobiles that starts way beyond the 1940s when they started building them here. So, um, Anna, maybe you can tell us a little bit about how we even got started with a bookmobile. Sure. It's, it's really an interesting history. And it actually started um, in the 1830s. And there were these, uh, a group of brothers, four brothers, um, named the Harper Brothers, and they lived in New York City, and they actually created a library. Uh, it was called the uh, American School Library, and it was in conjunction with the American Society for the Diffusion of Useful Knowledge. What an 1830 or 1830s type <laughs> term, useful knowledge, diffusion of useful knowledge. So this library was about 50 books. It was a set. Okay. And it had everything in it from Chinese history to biographies on George Washington, Napoleon Bonaparte. I mean, wow. it was cool. Science, everything. It was meant to just get as much information to the people as it could in this set of books. Yeah. Um, and you'll it's like an encyclopedia set. Almost. It, it really is yeah. a humongous encyclopedia yeah. set. Um, so it was really neat. And they actually went on to... Um, create something called Harper's Bazaar. So I'm sure you guys have all uh, heard of course. that. Yeah, still around. Of course. So they were famous and they became more famous after they um, published this library, so to speak. So the Smithsonian Institute actually has the one copy. Uh, it's in its wood case. It's the one of the originals, probably the only original wow. in existence. So that's pretty cool. Um, and then a couple of years down the line, during the 1850s, you had things in England called perambulating, I always have to really pronounce that one, <laughs> perambulating libraries. And they were hor um, horse-drawn carts. And um, we are going to throw a couple of images of that up as well. They're neat. Just small carts. And these people would just push them around or um, horses would, of course, pull them to different parts of England and Europe. And it was to, and this is what the founder said, George Moore, you can look him up, Diffuse literature among the rural population. So that was kind of a big deal is to get this literature out there to the to the rural population. Yeah, because, I mean, you think a, a city like London, yeah. you know, there, or you come back home here to New York City, Philly, yeah. you probably don't have as much of a difficulty in spreading knowledge. But when you're in the rural areas, I'm sure it was very difficult. Absolutely. It's true in England. I'm sure it was true back here in the States as well, I would assume. Oh, absolutely. It was. And um, this was a big issue. Uh, at this time, during the 1800s and into the early 1900s, the, royal pop the rural population really wanted, they wanted to learn, and they didn't even know that much about books and literature. So they really were excited to learn about this. 
And as a matter of fact, um, there was a woman, okay, we're actually going to talk about a lot of ladies today um, in this episode, but there's a woman named Mary Lemus Titcomb, and she was from Washington County, Maryland. And she was a really neat woman, um, really, really extraordinary lady. She always had an interest in books. Um, she was a librarian in Vermont and multiple places uh, in the Northeast and New England. And when she got to Maryland, she worked for the Washington County uh, Free Library. And she really did a great job diffusing books into that area, but she wasn't, she felt that she needed to physically bring the books to the people. Mm, yeah. Because in this time, not everyone can just get to a library. I mean, you know, she was outside of Hagerstown, Maryland. So it's you know, decently populated at the time, but people just didn't have the ability to go there. So she came up with an idea of a book wagon. And in 1904, she, her dream became a reality. Uh, she started this book wagon and it was um, the first library in the world, her library, the Washington County Free Library, to carry books directly to remote homes. So literally carry the books to you. Wow. It is so neat. And let me tell you, there are some really neat images that we're going to be wow. showing you guys. I mean, these wagons went everywhere. Um, rough terrain, of course, things like that, but wow. really went out there and uh, distributed these books. And it was really quite, quite amazing what, what she did. And um, the people in the area were, were really gracious for it. They, they really liked it. Yeah, I mean, we talk, now that was 1904. 1904, and we talk here all the time about, we have cars that are that old, and we talk about how difficult the roads were for the cars to, yeah. to travel. I'm sure for the horse and wagon, this was not an easy task either. No, it was extremely difficult, um, rough terrain, um, again, mud. I feel like every episode, episode we've talked about <laughs> how difficult it is to travel. We have. <laughs> but... That is the reality it's of true. it. true, yeah. So it was very, very difficult. So eventually, in, I think, 1921, they purchased a Ford. They had an okay. actual vehicle now. So it was a lot easier for them to get around. Um, they even traveled to parts of West Virginia. Of course, Hagerstown, Maryland, that area. It's, you know, near the border of West Virginia. Yep. Mm -hmm. So she traveled all over. Um, children followed uh, this wagon and the Ford uh, vehicle all around. Like the, the county pipers, yeah, <laughs> just like the ice cream truck yeah. of 1904. Yeah. Okay, because everyone's following it, and they want to come to this. They want to learn how to read, yeah. um, and they want to be Im immersed in this knowledge. And it was just really um, a really interesting, neat, neat time. Yeah. And I hope you guys enjoy the photos coming up because I just love these yeah. photos. Um, but it was really, really cool. It was really yeah. quite interesting. Huh. But she wasn't the only lady, I'm assuming, that was into this because. Yeah. That's not unusual either. I mean, it seems like a lot of education type reforms, and this is one of them, I would argue, are often spearheaded by women. This is one of the yes. things that they were allowed to do yes. in that time period work in. So yeah. any other notable ladies or so this is um something that when we were doing research on this, we fell down the rabbit hole because this is so neat. These women, um, uh, sometimes they were called book women, uh, book ladies, or pack saddle librarians, okay. They were uh, members of this group called the Pack Horse Library Project, mainly in Kentucky throughout the Appalachian Mountains. Um, and Kentucky specifically was hit very hard during the Depression. OK, extremely hard. Even now, it's let's be honest, it's one of the poor states. It just, you know, and at this time it was even worse. So they were hit hard by the Depression. These people were seriously rural. I mean, like really out there. And they just could not get to, to libraries or even get to the places where this book wagon would go. So they developed this project. <laughs> the wagon probably couldn't get to them. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, you're yeah. talking mountains. Yeah. So um, these women literally rode horses and they would ride with a big bag of books on their side and they would ride their horse to these people's houses. They read to people. Because interesting fact, in this time, in 1930, only 30% of Kentucky residents could read. Oh, wow. So that's low. Yeah. Even in 1930, I mean, yeah. that is low. So it was neat because they would ride to these houses. They would read to folks, teach them how to read. So these people weren't just librarians. I mean, in the sense of delivering the books, they were educate. They were educators. Yeah, And definitely. teachers. Um, 
this project uh, employed around 200 people. So that was great um, during this time period, which was roughly 35 to 43. Um, so 1935 to 1943. So they employed a lot of people and they reached 100,000 residents approximately in um, mm -hmm. mostly Eastern Kentucky, but all throughout the state of Kentucky. Wow. Really cool. That's pretty amazing. It's very amazing. And I feel like this is one of those things that no one's heard of. Yeah, I really hadn't. You so have you to research it. Yeah. Yes. I encourage everybody, please read about these women because it's really amazing. And again, the photos and things you'll see are so neat. Um, it, it's just, yeah, I love this type of stuff. I know you do yeah. too. Cool. Really cool. Yeah, that's really, really, really cool. Neat. Yeah, that's our, I think that's our quick history. Yes. Today. Yes. On the origins of the bookmobile. Um, and definitely we have come a long way. They're still, they're still building bookmobiles. I don't see them very often, although I'm starting to see more photos of them out, you know, like in the news yes. and stuff. And, you know, now they're trying to, um, of course, think about the environmental impact. So now you have bookmobiles that are hybrids or, you know, trying to, uh, somehow reduce their emissions or their carbon footprint, so to speak. So that's becoming a thing. I've seen some, it almost looks like a scooter with a bookmobile, yeah. which would be a lot lower emissions than a big, huge truck like of we course. were building here. Yeah. Um, and of course, you know, it's still, you know, you're talking about Appalachia in the 30s. There are still a lot of areas in this country that don't have good access to the internet, to a library. Appalachia would still fall in that oh, category. Absolutely. Um, so there still is a, 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 a purpose or a reason to have these. Oh, for sure. Things. Yeah. Oh definitely. my goodness. Yeah. And oftentimes it's cheaper for different parts of the country as well mm. to have a bookmobile than to build a branch library. That's true. So yeah. it, it, you know, and even parts of Pennsylvania, I'm sure, let's be honest. I mean, yep. it's just so rural that it's hard to get to these places. Mm -hmm. So, um, April next year. Yes is National Bookmobile Day. When is it? The... It's April 14th. So, you know, stay stay tuned to yeah. us because we might, we're going to try to do something to celebrate that here. And um, we do have bookmobiles here. That we we have a bookmobile here. It's in, it's in rough shape. We got to clean it up a little, um, but we do have it. It used to be on display in the museum. Oh, wow. Probably... Before my time. Yeah, I'm I was sure. going to say maybe 10 years ago or so. So it's been a while. Uh, but we do have one. Dig it out. Maybe. Yeah. Keep but, an eye on it. Yeah, definitely. Watch out for us in April. For sure. And <laughs> next episode is going to be cool. And you're going to, you're going to spearhead that one. And we're going to talk yeah, about Durie. Yeah. Well, I have to, I have to narrow it down because we have a lot of stuff about Durie Day. So we'll, we'll find something about the Duries to talk about. Um, so if you've ever wondered why we have something called Durier Day or why we have so many Durier Days, we'll try to answer some of that next, yeah. month, next month. Yeah, so absolutely. Um, the museum, and I should say too, the last time we were we made an episode, the museum was not yet open. We are open now. Yeah. So come visit us. Uh, the museum's open from 9.30 to 4, Monday through Saturdays. We are currently closed on Sundays. We're doing that to um, help with cleaning right now during uh, COVID-19. I want to make sure you're all staying safe. So, but we'd love to see you. Uh, bring your mask. Yeah. And we'll see you in the museum. Absolutely. And again, follow us on uh, Facebook, website. Definitely. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thanks so much, guys.